there's nothing like an uplifting Pixar film to make you laugh, cry, and reflect on the little things in life. Then again, if you're the type of person who relishes the opportunity to theorise about all the little details in Pixar films, then you'll likely find yourself inundated with dark, scary, and depressing conclusions. Welcome back to The Binger, guys, and in today's video, we're going to be looking at those Pixar theories that will change your childhood forever. So, approach with caution, because we may just shatter some of your fondest childhood memories. We all knew a Sid when we were kids, the kid who seemingly had an evil agenda in everything they did, whether it was stealing your toys or destroying their own, and getting some sort of sick pleasure out of doing it. But what if Sid was a victim, specifically of neglect and possibly physical abuse? Although we see plenty of Sid in Toy Story, we don't see his parents. The only member of his family we see is his sister, who he mistreats. One theory suggests that Sid is from a broken home, suffering from neglect and the subsequent aggressive behaviour is a result of that. What neglect, you may ask? Well, the kid orders a rocket to be delivered to his house and nobody even bats an eyelid. How about, hey son, what are you planning to do with that huge explosive device? And by the way, son, where did you get that huge explosive device? Sid is seemingly free to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And in fact, you do see one of his parents, albeit very briefly. Remember when Buzz escapes Sid's room and is hiding from Scud the dog at the top of the stairs? Notice the guy passed out on the chair with empty cans around him? Sid's dad, maybe? Sid's dad not giving a care in the world that his son is up to no good in the next room? Sounds like neglect to us. And then there's the fact that Scud, the highly aggressive dog, seems to cower when he sees the dad in the chair, scared of what might happen to him if he disturbs him. What does this say about the dad then? Could he be abusive towards Sid and could this possibly be the reason Sid is the way he is? Aw, oh, the friendship between Kristoff and Sven is so heartwarming. They grew up together, cared for each other and have always got each other's back. Surely there is no way theorists could ruin this friendship. Wrong. If we go back to when Kristoff and Sven were younger, you can see that the baby reindeer was happily running around amongst the ice harvesters. Where did Sven come from? Where is Sven's family? One theory suggests that the ice harvesters killed Sven's mother and used her pelt to warm baby Kristoff, hence why the baby reindeer Sven is so attached to him. Maybe Sven just picked up her scent and mistakenly thinks Kristoff is his mother. There's even a scene later on where Kristoff is singing to Sven, much like a mother would do to their child. Okay, it may be a stretch, but you're thinking about it. Right? There's quite a few different ways to approach this one. There's even far-reaching theories to do with magic and the way it could possibly be the reason certain animals in other Pixar movies can talk. But let's just stick with the adorable Boo for now. So we all know Boo, right? The cute kid from Monsters Inc. who ends up part of Mike and Sully's adventures. It's clear from the film that she adores Mike and Sully, particularly Sully, or Kitty as she calls him. And she's upset when they have to leave her at the end. Okay, Sully gets to see her again, but we have to assume that this is a one-time thing and that ultimately, they parted ways. But what if Boo then set out looking for Sully and never stopped looking? The theory goes that Boo is the witch in Pixar's Brave. She's been using the door portals, as seen in Monsters, Inc., to travel to different worlds to look for him. Ever notice the way the witch in Brave disappears when she goes through doors? Coincidence? Nah, we don't think so. With the use of magic, Boo also learned how to time travel, and she has been flitting to different points in the timeline, unsure of where to find Sully. She can even be seen carving a pizza planet truck out of wood, proof she's been to the future. And then there's the numerous carvings and effigies of Sully in her cabin. There can only be one explanation. A witch! A witch! A witch! Contrary to what this title might suggest, this is actually the chirpiest entry on this list. Remember Bing Bong from Inside Out, Riley's lovable childhood imaginary friend? Well, if you've seen Inside Out, then you'll know that it doesn't end too well for Bing Bong. He sacrifices himself and is erased from Riley's memory forever. But what if Bing Bong wasn't imaginary at all? What if he was a monster from the Monstropolis, working alongside Mike and Sully, and he regularly visited Riley's bedroom when she was younger? Once he stopped visiting her, he lived on in her memory as an imaginary friend. So, Bing Bong isn't gone forever. He's probably still going strong, visiting kids and, due to his comic capabilities, collecting barrelfuls of laughter energy along the way. Ah, <sighs> Right, that's enough smushy niceness for now. Back to the depressing stuff. Suffering the loss of someone close to you is one of the most traumatizing experiences ever, and it can leave some people, and even some fish it would seem, searching for a way to cope. 
One Finding Nemo theory suggests that Marlin the Clownfish was searching for a way to grieve and find acceptance throughout the film, and that Nemo never really went missing at all. So picture this, in the scene where Marlin and his wife, hang on a sec, do fish get married? Never mind, it's not important. In the scene where Marlin and his wife are trying to protect their eggs from a barracuda, Nemo is seemingly the only surviving egg, but a theory suggests that Nemo didn't survive at all, leaving Marlin all alone. Finding Nemo is not about finding Nemo at all. It's about Marlin finding acceptance through the five stages of grief. You know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, then acceptance. In the end of the film, we see Marlin is much more relaxed when it comes to protecting his son Nemo. This could be a metaphor for how he no longer feels the need to cling on to Nemo's memory and that he can now carry on with his life without the burden of grief. Sheesh. Coffee, anyone? There is a seemingly endless list of theories about Andy's dad and why he isn't in any of the Toy Story movies. Some say he and his mum got divorced. Another theory says that he was a police officer who died on the job. One of the biggest and most convincing theories, however, is that Andy's dad passed away when Andy was younger and that he was also called Andy. The theory comes from YouTube star Mike Mozart, who claims that Andy's dad, or Andy Sr., had Woody as a toy when he was younger, and he's the one who gave him the iconic Andy tag on his foot. Andy Sr. passed away when Andy Jr. was really young, and Woody was passed on to him. From then on, Andy Jr. would write Andy on all of his toys to match Woody. See how his writing is different to the writing on Buzz's foot? Eh? Eh? It's also interesting that when Woody is almost accidentally sold at the yard sale, Andy's mum steps in and says, It's an old family toy. It would also explain why they are selling the house in the first Toy Story movie. Maybe because it belonged to Andy Sr. and they can't bear being in the house with so many memories. Or if you want to get really depressing, maybe they just couldn't afford it anymore. You can get really into the weeds with this theory if you wanted to and look at exactly how Andy Sr. passed away. The theory by Mike Mozart suggests that he suffered from polio and it eventually took his life. Yeah, thanks Mike. Thanks a lot for that. Up may have shattered our emotions to smithereens in the first five minutes, but at least the story that followed was unquestionably uplifting. Pun intended. However, if this theory is to be believed, then actually it wasn't. The rest of the film is also pretty sad. After losing his wife and spending the rest of his life alone and grumpy, the story goes that Mr. Fredrickson decided to act on his and his wife's dream of going to their ideal destination, Paradise Falls. He hooks up his house to a few balloons and off he goes. But what if that didn't really happen? What if his house rising from the ground up into the sky is symbolic of him passing away and ascending to heaven? Then there's Russell, his guardian angel, and his final dreamlike destination, Paradise Falls, aka the Gates of Heaven, and his Arcadia. Sure, it's sad, but kind of sweet at the same time. He only wanted to be with his wife and explore, and if this theory is true, then hopefully he'd have got his wish. As for the talking dogs and Kevin the multicolored bird, jury's still out on what they could mean. Grim title, right? Well, this is one of the most frequently discussed Toy Story theories on the internet, and for good reason. There is a lot of evidence to back it up. According to many different theorists, the storyline to Toy Story 3 mirrors that of World War II, specifically that of the Jewish people and the way they were treated by the Nazis. At the start of the film, the toys are driven out of their home and almost put into the attic to save them being thrown in the trash, a possible Anne Frank reference. They are then transported to Sunnyside, a place for unwanted, old or broken toys, a possible reference to the war's concentration camps. They are mistreated there and ruled under a very strict routine by a dictator-like character called Lotso. There are other references and moments of repression throughout, but arguably the most significant moment that justifies the theory is the furnace scene. We all know of the horrifying gas chambers used in the Nazi concentration camps, and this furnace scene seems to kind of recreate that as the unwanted toys are sent to their deaths. Right, that's enough of that theory. The thing that makes the cars in Cars so entertaining, lovable and relatable is that they share similar traits and cultural habits to us. Whether that's making sarcastic comments, obsessing over winning or the fact that they have eyes, a mouth and can talk to each other. But how could sentient cars just exist in a world so similar to ours without any trace of human beings anywhere? And if humans don't exist, why do cars have windows and door handles if nobody's going to be getting in or out? They share so many characteristics with us, but apparently we don't exist in their world, or at least we don't exist in our conventional form. 
One theory proposes that humans actually are the cars. Don't worry, we are going somewhere with this. The story goes that some sort of apocalypse happened, resulting in human beings being incapable of exploring the outside world without the proper apparatus. In this case, that could have been cars. Over the years, humans become more and more reliant on these machines or systems and ultimately evolved along with the car, becoming a strange human-car hybrid thingy, and ultimately the smiling automotive face on merchandise everywhere. So humans may just be hooked up to a series of wires and tubes inside the cars, operating their movements and speech. Sort of like a mix between those giant baby pods from the Matrix and a light cycle from Tron. Well, as Owen Wilson would say, wow. So, which Pixar theories blew your mind? Did we miss any of your favourite theories out? Be sure to let us know in the comments section below, and don't forget to subscribe to the Binger YouTube channel for more awesome videos like this. See you next time.